so we might okay be... we're wrong okay um just sir just for the record um first and last name how you like to be called norman norman and spell both please okay name is norman hatch normally i'm called norm by everybody that knows me and uh what else do you need okay um spell hatch please hatch is h-a-t-c-h -H, okay. just like a board ship and the um the rank that you were i'm sorry uh, okay the rank that you were during the time of the the war that we're, the battle we're talking about at tarawa i was uh, 21 years of age and uh, i had been in the marine corps since 1939 and uh, I had five years service at that point in time. And what was your rank? What, what I was a staff sergeant. Staff sergeant. And so what was your total time of service from when to when? 39 to? Well, my total service is 41 years and eight months. This is a combination of reserve and regular time. Okay. Because what we do with the retired guys is we we don't put the time of service, so I don't really need that. I just need to say retire. What did you retire as? What was your highest rank? My final rank was major. Okay, so that's uh, that's perfect. All yeah. right, so what we're doing with the retired guys is we're telling what the final rank is. When we lower thirds, mm -hmm. we'll bring you up. Um, we'll say that when we when we bring the graphics up front and kind of set up the story, we'll call you staff sergeant because that's mm -hmm. what you that's were right. at that time. That's okay. right. Okay. Um, and what branch of service were you in, sir? United States Marine Corps. Okay. Now what's that? Well, Something else. You know, shut <laughs> that door. Place, Simon, where was it? It was called what? And spelled, well, the battle for Tarawa uh, was uh, in the mid Pacific, and it was the beginning of a uh, series of battles to knock out Japanese uh, islands that uh, pretty much encompassed the Pacific Ocean area. Okay, hold on one sec. Before we go into the story, I'm just doing it so we have the information. How do you spell Tarawa? Tarawa is spelled T A R A W A. Okay. And it is pronounced Tarawa, not Tarawa. Tarawa, okay. And what date or what dates or month or period are we talking about that this happened? Well, this happened on November 20th, 1943. Okay. So we got, okay, good. We're covering our background. Okay, now we'll get into your story. Um, when you got word that you were going to Tarawa, um, tell me about where you were what you thought you were going to do there um, and you know give me kind of the, the beginning details even before you arrived just kind of some background I was a member of the 2nd Marine Division photographic section uh, the 2nd Marine Division was stationed in New Zealand and uh, uh, parts of it had been in Guadalcanal and uh, also Samoa and uh, it finally was all one division it was training as such and when we got the word that we were going to combat, uh, those of us down at the lower level didn't know where. We just knew it would be somewhere in the Pacific. And uh, we were not told where it would be until we got aboard ship and the ships were underway. And that was all total for secrecy. And, and uh, uh, only the staff and command top-level people knew what the target was. I'm going to stop before yeah, and also that... if you can repeat, because I noticed the camera had been set on 9 dB. I just wanted to change it. Okay, we'll, we'll repeat that. But is that fly, mm -hmm. like, obviously? I saw something frame. like a moth it's fly a through the frame, frame, but I didn't see it then. coming in front of the frame. Okay, we have to kill it. I'm going to kill it. <laughs> We're rolling. Okay. Um, actually, before we begin, what the unit was called, what was the unit you were part of? Uh, I was in the photographic section of the 2nd Marine Division. And where were they based out of? Uh, the 2nd Marine Division was located in Wellington, New Zealand, and the surrounding countryside. Okay. And um, what would, do we call you? Do we call you a, what's your title, cameraman or photojournalist? What do we call you? No, we're in, we weren't photojournalists in those days. Uh, we were part of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, an organization that was based in Quantico, Virginia, which was the photographic services section. And... They assigned motion picture cameramen to each one of the divisions to be what we tell now today call combat cameramen. Okay, so can I call you a combat sure, cameraman? Sure, sure. sense back sure. then? Okay. Well, All right. You ready, Mike? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, sir, take us again. We'll start from the beginning of that story. Take mm -hmm. us to um, when you got your assignment, you didn't know mm -hmm. where you were going, and you had one on ships and... We had a lot. Of, we were in New Zealand for about 11 months, so we had a lot of training there. But when the word came that we were to go uh, to combat, 
those of us down at the lower levels didn't have the slightest idea where. We knew it would be somewhere in the Pacific. And it wasn't until we got aboard ship that we were told what our target was going to be. And there were uh, excellent, uh, uh, excellent pieces of information given out by the officers aboard ship. There were even, even uh, sand maps so that they could show what the island looked like and where different regiments would be landing and that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, but for us as, a, as, as photographers, uh, it was really the first time that we were going to be involved in an assault on a heavily fortified beachhead. And uh, I didn't realize at the time how important that was uh, because none, never in the history of warfare had there been a successful landing under those conditions. And uh, so... Uh, uh, we in the 2nd Marine Division were going to do it. And uh, when we found out about Tarawa and how heavily fortified it was, uh, it, uh, it did put a little bit of the fear into us that it was going to be a tough job. But after watching the battleships and the uh, carrier aircraft uh, bombard that island and had been doing so for three, four, or five days, we figured that we'd just have to carry our shovels in to bury the Japanese, not to fight them. But uh, we, that proved to be wrong. Uh, they were well dug in, and, uh, and all the heavy guns that the Japanese had were not silenced and were very much of a detriment to later landings. Let's go over that a little bit more. Um, keep rolling, Mike. How, so were you sitting offshore <laughs> on your ship watching this bombardment, or did you kind of arrive after the bombardment? Oh, no, the bombardment went on. Uh, they started early in the morning. Uh, there had been ships there, you know, uh, like battleships, cruisers, and destroyers ahead of our, us getting there uh, because they were doing the so-called softening up of the island. But uh, uh, we had first call at 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, everybody piled out to get their breakfast of steak and eggs, which is a ne typical Navy, Navy breakfast for going into combat. And... Uh, and then, uh, you know, you come up on deck and, and you, you hear all this loud noise of the battleships firing and you see tremendous bursts on the island and the airdrops and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, it's quite impressive. And uh, you figure, well, you know, you've really got it made uh, with all of this. Uh, there isn't going to be much of a fight. But uh, uh, as a photographer, you photograph what's going on around you. You don't just stand there and watch what's happening with battleships. You take pictures of battleships firing. You take pictures of the troops getting ready to load up and, and, and they're beginning to take jeeps out of the hold and put them into, into a small craft and, and uh, all of the things that are necessary to begin an operation. And then you go over the side with your camera gear and down into, in, in my case, into a Higgins boat, and, uh, which is known as an LCVP. And, uh, and so uh, that means landing craft vehicle personnel. It can take a Jeep, it can, of course, take people. So uh, uh, you photograph the guys coming down the, the rope net and with all their gear and getting into the boats. And, and you tell a story as you go along with uh, what's happening. So now we're in the boat, we're cruising in, and there are other boats around us, and, and uh, they make a good picture because they're splashing waves. and and surging and you photograph the guys in the in the hull that you're in and uh, uh, everybody's calm and quiet nobody's excited about anything and so uh, that's what you do now at Tarawa we were advised that there was a reef that came out about four or five hundred yards and uh, that depending on the tide depending on the wind we would be able to go over the reef with our boats or depending on the tide and the wind, we wouldn't be able to. And what I mean by that is that, that if the tide was running against us, there would be less water on the reef. And if the wind was coming from the land, it would also blow the water off the reef. And coming from Gloucester, Massachusetts and growing up amongst boats, fishing boats, water, knowing all about what was going on, I could understand that. And so, I had hoped that we would have water that uh, would carry us in, but we didn't. And uh, 
the minute that uh, the particular boat I was in hit the hit the reef, why uh, it uh, uh, it was really a, a jarring effect, and the ramp would not go down. It apparently, had locked up some way somehow, so everybody had to go out over the gunnels of the boat. That's over the top sides, and the sides of the gunnels were about even with my shoulders, and I was at six foot one, six foot one and a half at that time. So that meant kids with 60, 70 pounds of gear on them had to climb up over that side, then drop into water, which was probably up to their chest, and it was up to my chest. So if, it was up, if that's where it was on me, you know that a kid five foot six or seven or eight maybe was uh, was swimming, and uh, so uh, it was very tough uh, to to get in. And if anybody's ever tried to walk in water, they know how impossible it is, even in salt water. But fortunately. Having a lot of equipment on you, it held you down, kept your feet on the ground, and you could walk in water. And uh, but a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. So we would Kelleher, Bill Kelleher was my assistant, who was a PFC. Uh, uh, we were the last two to go over the side on the boat, and uh, uh, I put Kelly in the water first, and I loaded up. We were carrying two canisters each that that had ten rolls of film in it put those on his shoulders like this and strap the IMO that he carried on his wrist and that's the way he walked in. That's the way I walked in. A sailor did the same thing to me. And so we were upright walking in while everybody was down at helmet level in the water to avoid the fire that was coming from the, under the pier and over the machine gun over to our left. And uh, we saw people being hit. It looked like a herd of turtles going in at feeding time. Just nothing but helmets going along the water. Uh, but you'd see one guy get hit and another guy get hit. But Kelly and I were standing upright walking in with these things on our shoulders and, and uh, we managed to walk in without any, without any problem. But when we got in, we collapsed totally. It was exhausting. It was really exhausting. I want to, I want to stop you. I want to go back. Yeah. Let's hold the point. We're good because right now we're at the beach. I want to ask a couple questions um, going back. The, the ride from the um, ship to the shore. How far and how long was that? A couple of miles. So how long would that take on the boat that you were on? Well, it, um, I don't know, they probably cruised at maybe five, six miles an hour with a full load. So meanwhile, all the guys are in there kind of thinking and getting ready for battle. You're working. You're about yeah. the only guy, other, other than the guy driving the boat, you're pretty much working. That's right. Did that make a difference? That make it easier for you that you didn't kind of think about what you're about to go into? Or tell but, me from the perspective of a combat cameraman, you're kind of viewing the war very differently because you're looking at it through a lens. Well, I didn't realize until after the war, really, what happened when I was in a shooting mode. And that was that when I was looking through the viewfinder, I was disassociated from what was going on around me to a certain extent. That didn't mean that my marine training all of a sudden disappeared and I wasn't trying to take care of myself or be cognizant of what was happening. But, uh, but I was making a movie. I was living in the movie, so to speak. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that divorced me from a lot of the, the problems that the average grunt would have. And, uh, and so uh, uh, it, it, it just was uh, a complete divorcement from, from the reality. Do you feel because of that, that you kind of came away from these situations psychologically maybe differently than the other guys because your viewpoint was diff different? Uh, I agree with that question completely because uh, the, uh, uh, I don't have the same, and I never had the same effects about the battles, and I'll tell you why. A uh, photo section made up of, say, 30 some odd photographers. Uh, we were a group, but at the time that we got ready in New Zealand to mount out, we were divorced from our section, and everybody was sent to the organization that they would land with during the battle. Now, they didn't know anybody. They hadn't slept with anybody. They hadn't trained with anybody. They hadn't lived and eaten and told stories about their wives and daughters and what have you with anybody in that group. So consequently, you were not emotionally tied to them, and uh, and of course that was a godsend in our in our sense because even though 
we felt very badly about people that we saw that were badly hit or, sh or, or, or damaged and that we were photographing, we still didn't know them. So we didn't have that connection. And I think that's probably the best part about, about being a, uh, a photographer uh, in that sense is that, that uh, uh, if you lose a photographer, you aren't even there when he's hit, whether he's wounded or killed, because he's out with a regiment, a battalion, or a company, and you haven't seen him for one day, two days, three days, in the case of Iwo Jima, maybe not for five days. And so, consequently, uh, I apologize, yeah. so consequently, um, you just don't have that, that, that close rapport with the people that you're covering. So, yeah, in other words, you know, you do with the photographers, you never fight with them, you never work with them because you're kind of being inserted in other groups and you're kind of the outsider. That's really true, no but you also have to remember, in those particular days, uh, at Tarawa, we were brand new. The whole idea of photography in war was brand new. Now, that isn't to say that, that you know, uh, we had pictures out of the Civil War, we had pictures out of the Spanish-American War, pictures out of World War I. There were pictures down in, taken down of Marines training in Viegas, for example. But in actual combat, which is different from all this other stuff, uh, in World War II, uh, there was a specific requirement to take pictures, and thus the, the size of the photo sections, and the fact that we would have 30 men in a division to do exactly this, to photograph. Well, uh, even though they had seen us around at times in the training down in New Zealand, I was told many times up in the front line at Tarawa, you don't have to be here. What are you here for? You're a photographer. You don't have to be here. And I, my response to them would be basically, I've got to be here as much as you do. Because what I am doing is going to be, be tenfold in use afterwards. And, uh, it, you know, everything from the Joint Chiefs of Staff is going to look at it, all the way down to guys making training films. And the public's going to look at it and everything else. So, did, you, did you have a sense that you were doing it for historical purposes as well? Oh, yes, yeah. It, uh, historical was one of the reasons. Uh, we had, had uh, uh, half a dozen, well, I think five, basic reasons why we're there to cover operationally and public affairs wise and, and uh, history and, and uh, operations. In one or two lines, can you just tell me what the job of a combat photographer is? So, you know, by just yeah, the, a the, combat the, photographer's the, job is... Yeah, a combat photographer, photographer's job is to document anything and everything that's happening in the unit that he's attached to. He's got to stay on his toes. He's got to know. He's got to. He's got to, uh, uh, if necessary, force his way in on the seniors, commanders' briefings in the mornings of what's happening, where they plan to go, what they plan to do, so he knows as much as they do, so that he can go ahead and plan his photography. Uh, this takes a little chutzpah. Uh, it. Uh, you've got to convince some battalion commander or some company commander that. It's absolutely necessary that you do this, and, uh, and of course today uh, they have been integrated for so long into the system that everybody knows they're there and uh, knows why they're there practically. But in in the time that I'm talking about, it was relatively a new thing. Now I want to get back to um, before you. Now we've got you on the beach, but I want to get back to. And if I can get you to say it again, but a little bit more succinctly, that the difference, you guys and your assistant, you had to carry your gear. And I don't need to necessarily know yeah. the details, but if you can just kind of tell me. We had to stand up taller in the water to carry the gear, and everybody else was crouching down at chin level. And I, I, what I wanted to do is kind of give the sense that you were a bigger target, but the reason why, because, you know, you were holding up your gear. So if you can kind of tell me that part again, okay. a little bit more succinctly. So you get off the, um, the boat, you're in the water, tell me about what you do. Once we've had the camera equipment loaded on our shoulders, uh, we then start the walk into the beach, which is 400, 500 yards away. Uh, everybody who had gone off the boat before us was now crouched down at helmet level in the water. And as I have often said, they look like a herd of turtles going into the beach at feeding time. And uh, uh, 
we were standing up as perfect targets, and there were people, uh, snipers shooting at those of us who'd come out of the boat underneath the pier to our right, and also a machine gun was firing from the left. And uh, I saw a lot of bullets skipping along the water, and uh, but none of them touched either Kelly or I. Actually, I want, I want to stay in this moment a little bit. What what was going on? Were there a lot of vessels kind of landing at the same time? No, no. Were there, you the first to be No, the... yeah. We, uh, <clears throat> when the, uh, the, the boat I was in uh, belonged to the battalion commander, and uh, this is a slightly addition to the story, uh, when I assigned myself to his particular organization because he had been on Guadalcanal and had been a real character and I figured that wherever he was going to go, there was going to be trouble, and that would be the place to go to shoot. So I went to see him, and uh, I had got an appointment with him, and he said, well, Sergeant, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I've been assigned. I didn't tell him I had assigned myself, but I said, I've been assigned to, uh, to cover your phase of the operation. And uh, he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a motion picture photographer. He said, I don't want any goddamn Hollywood Marine with me. And I said, sir, I've had five years service. I've gone through all the training. And I know that if I need to, all I have to do is bend down and pick up a rifle. So there was dead silence for a moment. And he looked at me and I said, stay the hell out of my way. So consequently, I stayed as close to him as I could get. And so that's why when we went in, I went into his boat. I sat on the engine hatch right alongside of him. And he never said a word. But as he was surveying his beachhead, Red Beach 3 on Tarawa, he saw the trouble the amphibious tractors were having. We were in a boat, but there were three waves of amphibious tractors ahead of us. And that machine gun I was telling you about was firing at the amphibious tractors, and they were not armored at the, in those days. They were like tin cans. A 30 cal or a 50 cal would go right through them. So the coxswains or drivers were a little scared. But remember, there's a pier off here to the right, and they were beginning to close their ranks like this to try to get as close to the pier as they could because they thought they'd get away from the machine gun. Well, he saw this, uh, the, uh, the major did, and uh, Major Crow, and he said, Coxon, I'm losing my beachhead. He was visualizing the other boats coming behind us, uh, or they would be coming behind us. And so he said, put this goddamn boat in now. So that's, the Coxon was a little <laughs> worried about this. And first he didn't want to, and he, he reinforced his order and so that's where we went full speed in and hit the beach. We were the only, actually we were the first boat to get in on the beach at Tarawa and the first troop. But his purpose was to widen that beachhead so that the following boats would have an opportunity to have some place to land. So what you're getting now is really small arms fire, nothing bigger than that at this point? No, no, nothing, nothing larger. We were getting small arm fire. Uh, we didn't fall under the range of the bigger guns on the island at that point in time. Okay. Now you're on the beach. Um, this is day one, I assume. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what time day we're we talking about? Well, the um, uh, I think that the original original daytime uh, or original time for the beginning of the attack from the ships was at. Um, I'm trying to think whether it was. 0800 or 0900, but anyway, uh, the fire received from from the island was so close that the ships pulled back another five miles, which de delayed the the landing time uh, till probably nine or ten o'clock. Uh, I've forgotten exactly for that. You'd have to check the records uh, on it. But uh, what was particularly bad was that the the amphibious tractors had been circling around, and they went very slowly. And now they followed the ships back out because they didn't have all their people aboard as yet. So they had to come back that five miles to, uh, uh, to, to get the troops that they were going to carry in. So they had another additional five miles to go back into the beach. And so it slowed everything down for the actual H-hour landing hour. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, as I said, uh, Crow said, put that boat, get that boat in right now. And so we were the first ones in a boat to hit the beach. Everything else had been amphibious tractors. Um, when, 
again, I know we're, we keep on kind of going back, but I just want to make sure we get it all covered. When you're um, in the hull of this boat, pulling, you know, pulling in from the ship, going towards the beach, you said everybody was kind of quiet and calm. Was there any chatter going on? Any talk? Any praying? What what what, what, what is the deal? No, of guys I, I don't. You know, if there, to go to if there was any praying go, going on down in the in the, uh, in the LCVP amongst the men. It would have been silent. It would have been personal. There wasn't anything out, outgoing or, or no, nobody getting down on knees or doing anything like that. <clears throat> they were checking their equipment, among other things. They had to stand up. They couldn't sit down. So everybody was sort of packed in there. And uh, the, uh, uh, there was conversation. I mean, and the, there were senior NCOs who were endeavoring to keep the morale up by talking to the guys and, and uh, you know, sort of reliving some of the, the uh, old statements uh, uh, like Dan Daly, what do you want to do, live forever? <laughs> Leading a charge and, and uh, so uh, uh, it's that kind of thing. But, but, but they had been trained so well that, that they knew what they had to do and they knew what it was going to be like. Okay, so they are on the beach, you're getting small arms fire, Let's, um, we'll go from there. So tell me more about Tarawa. Well, we've, when Kelly, Bill Kelleher and I got on the beach, we were exhausted uh, walking through that amount of water. Uh, there's a lot of resistance in water. It, uh, when you swim in it, you don't feel it, but when you, if you try to walk in it, you discover you're not going very far. And so, uh, well, we finally got our wind back and, and got our energy back, uh, uh, we just started photographing what was happening on, happening on the beach. There were guys that were digging in. Uh, there was a seawall in front of us of about four logs high. And uh, we used that as a, as a backdrop, so to speak, or a background so uh, we could sit with our back to that and photograph what was happening out in the water, what was happening on the beach. And uh, so uh, uh, Jim Crow had a, an Amtrak that had pull, been pulled up on the Beach and was lodged pretty much on the seawall, and he used that as his command post uh, uh, to be able to direct the uh, the activities. And uh, uh, he had to go and uh, send an officer out to corral a lot of the men who'd come in in these boats and these amphib tractors that had ended up in the water, and they had gone underneath the pier for safety's sake. A lot of them had lost their rifles in the water because they'd been dog paddling, and it's kind of hard to do with a rifle in your hand. But uh, uh, he sent a lieutenant over, and the lieutenant went through and dragged everybody out. And even if some of the men didn't belong to his organization, they did now. And uh, so uh, that often happens in landings. Boats get off and diverted into a different uh, beachhead. Uh, uh, troops walk over in a different angle and wind up in your, your yard, so to speak. And so... <clears throat> Whoever's out there, he grabbed them and pulled them in and, and put them into a sense of organization and, and uh, located weapons for them and all that was necessary. Okay, but want, let's 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 take that and put it back on on you. Okay. So your what do you, what's your job? Your are shooting I'm, all I'm, this. I'm, and... I'm, my job once I'm on the beach is to document what's happening, what's going on. What are you seeing? What's what's, what's yeah? What 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 I'm seeing? I'm seeing uh, things like. Uh, uh, boats that had come in, and they, the minute they dropped the ramp, a shell from a nine-inch nine-inch rifle over on the other side of the island would land right in the boat and blow everybody to pieces in the boat too. Soon as the ramp went down, and that meant that <clears throat> the Japs had the reef zeroed in perfectly with their artillery, and uh, so as a result of that, uh, that happened to maybe a half a dozen boats before. Uh, boat commanders like, or, or, or battalion commanders like Jim Crow got on the phone to the ships and told the commanding general that don't send any more boats in because these guys are just too deadly until we get these nine-inch rifles out of here. We're not going to be able to land any more troops successfully. So uh, that's what happened. And no more boats came in that day. So we were the only people on the beach, those of us who had landed in what relatively would be called the first three waves, of amphibious tractors, and uh, uh, there were 5,000 Japanese soldiers, actually Marines, uh, Riga Sentai as they're called, and uh, uh, they uh, 
uh, were just about 5,000 strong. And consequently, if they hadn't lost their communications on the beach, they would have, uh, uh, they would have been able to push us off that night because we didn't have the strength to hold it. And uh, uh, fortunately uh, uh, for us, uh, but we didn't know they'd lost their communications. In fact, the loss of communications was so bad that their commanding general, along with some of the members of his staff, left that first morning and started to walk from the island of Basio, which in, it was in the Tarawa Atoll, uh, to the next island. And you could do this because it would be like a, a miniature reef between islands and of low water there, and you could walk across to the next island. But it just so happened that a pilot and one of the aircraft flying overhead spotted this group of men walking along. And it was down in an area where we didn't have any troops. And uh, so he called to a destroyer to drop a shell on them, which they did, and annihilated them. So the Japanese troops on the island did not know that their commanding general was dead and gone. And we didn't know that they didn't know it, and we didn't know it that he was gone. We didn't know who they'd killed. And as uh, they laid all of their wire, their communications wire, right on the ground, and that's one thing that the, the uh, battleships and with their 14-inch shells skittering around the sand was able to devastate, as well as the bombing from aircraft. So the Japanese on one point of the island couldn't talk to Japanese on the other point. Let's talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the facts and figures. Tarawa was an atoll. Was this one island, or was it considered multiple islands? Or what, there, uh, the how big was it? Tarawa Atoll uh, had a half a dozen islands involved in it, in the shape of a crescent, pretty much. And uh, the uh, uh, the one we landed on was called Betio, B E T I O, and. Uh, uh, it was the largest of the group and was considered the headquarters of, uh, of the natives who lived there before the Japanese took it over. But uh, uh, it was just a sandy at atoll uh, completely in the island of Basio itself to give some sort of a visual impression. For It was one-third the size of Central Park in New York. And in 76 hours, there were over 6,000 people killed and over 2,000 people wounded. So you've got, uh, you know, uh, pretty co pretty close to an eight to 9,000 casualty rate in 76 hours. I'm going to actually ask you to repeat that. That was just our guys, not their guys, right? No, 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 that was total, total. total. Can you clarify that? Tell me that again. Yeah, Let's that, okay. In the 76 hours, there were, uh, uh, there were pretty close to 5,000 Japanese killed a little over a thousand Marines killed and 2,000 wounded, Marines wounded. And so uh, uh, that gives you a total pretty close to, you know, seven or 8,000, 9,000 men, people that were hurt one way or the other, killed and in, wounded. In, in, in how big an area? Uh, the area for Basio uh, was one third the size of Central Park in New York. And uh, uh, all of us, battle for that small piece of ground that took place in 76 hours. Okay, what was the strategic importance of it? Why did it have to be taken? <laughs> well, there was a plan devised by Commander-in-Chief Pacific that to be able to find bases for aircraft, we had to do island hopping through the Pacific. And most of the islands that we wanted that had the capacity to uh, have airfields on them were all currently owned by the Japanese. They had invaded them, taken them over. And, uh, and it wasn't until we got to Iwo that we ran into the first piece of Japan. The island of Iwo Jima uh, was controlled by the prefect of Tokyo um, administratively. So it, uh, it was a very uh, 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 it was a very interesting thing. So it, this this island was controlled by Japan. That's right. Okay. So how? So, but was this an island big enough to land anything on, or was it? Oh just, yes, yes. Okay. The, the island, the island had or had an airstrip on it, and one of the things was that that if there are islands through the Pacific in the areas where we want to go, 
that have airplanes on them that could do damage to us, do damage to the fleet. That's what we wanted to get rid of. And then as we got further out, later on, the B-29s became a project, and that took place on Saipan and Tinian, which we took, so that they could have the capability of flying to Japan from there. Tell me, let's go back to the battle. How close did you ever get to the enemy yourself? And what did you see? <coughs> Tell me some of those great shots that you got. Well, on, Jap on, uh, on Tarawa, just like most of the islands that we invaded, the Japanese were pretty well buried in uh, foxholes of their own, uh, pillboxes, uh, uh, various kinds of emplacements. Uh, uh, they used a very simple procedure in most cases. They, uh, they used logs and then sand, uh, and then on buildings they would perhaps build up concrete and then put sand over that and then logs over the sand and then more sand over those logs. So uh, when the heavy, uh, heavy guns took off after them, the 14 inches, they, uh, even though they were armor uh, type shells, all they did was hit the sand and skitter off. They didn't penetrate because it was the sand gave way and it just and it just like like a little snowplow, and there were lots of 14-inch shells laying all over that island that had never exploded. So uh, uh, I uh, really didn't see a great deal of the Japanese until the third day, and uh, uh, I might find one that was half dead or whatever, or something like that. But but on the third day, I was photographing. Uh, the taking of a very large sand blockhouse, and uh, uh, I was standing in a position where, whereby uh, I was somewhat near the edge of it, and I heard one of the Marines yell, here come the Japs. So I just swiveled my body. I didn't move my legs, but to hold my steadiness and my balance, I swiveled my body from dead center to the left, and in my frame was a Marine machine gunner laying on the ground, and there were dozens of Japanese coming out of the big blockhouse that we were attacking. And uh, so uh, I would say that um, while that little firefight went on, I couldn't have been probably more than 100 feet away from them. And, uh, and there was something unique about that. I mean, that was kind of, um, for the Pacific War, there weren't really any document, there wasn't any footage really of getting both our side and their side of the same frame. Well, that, uh, to, uh, to uh, sort of quote Andy Warhol, who said that everybody deserves his 15 minutes of fame, that particular footage of, that I shot of the Japanese and, and, and our own troops in the same frame was the only time in the Pacific War that something like that was done. And it probably lasted about, at the max, maybe 60 seconds. And uh, so I say, well, I had my 60 seconds worth of fame because it's lasted for 61 years uh, in, in the sense that the film is constantly being used. When you were shooting it, did you know what you were seeing? Did you kind of really sense that um, you, know, you got the Japanese and you got the Americans, or is it just too much? Confusion? Yes, I did, because I've got a telegram upstairs that uh, I said to my wife, and I, in it I said, I think there's something unusual in this. He said, I shot some Japanese or their troops fighting, and... Uh, I'm pretty sure I got them, but I don't know because I didn't see it. You know, I had no chance to look at it. But uh, that's a, that's the only time, to the best of my knowledge, in the Pacific War, and also in the European War, that the enemy was in the same frame with us in a fighting stance. Well, when you saw that footage after it was developed, and or you heard about it, what was your reaction? Well, I was glad. <laughs> it, it was. Uh, I was happy that it turned out right. You know, it, uh, you just don't know. I'll, I'll give you a good example of this after. Okay, just one. I'll give you a good example of that. After the battle was over, we went to Hawaii to regroup and, and to, for the division to have a, a place to live. And uh, I was immediately ordered into headquarters along with three or four other guys, that, uh, one other photographer, still man, and uh, uh, three combat correspondence, including the public affairs officer. And I thought, we must have done something awfully wrong. I was, well, I was expecting that, that uh, I'd get, you know, like you saw in the old movies of the 
uh, guy did something wrong, they tear the epaulets off his blouse and tear his medals off and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I wonder what the hell it was. I, I, my footage must not have turned out. And they want me in there to know why. Because terror was a big, big thing in the public mind. It happened just before Thanksgiving and all this murderous three, three days uh, they had just never heard of anything like that before. And so, uh, uh, and my footage was now in the newsreels. It had been released in San Francisco. Uh, didn't even go to Washington. Joint staff didn't see it. And so, uh, it, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't see it until uh, I was ordered up to the Army Pictorial Center in New York to narrate a film that Frank Capra was doing he was a major at that time in the army, and uh, I saw it up there for the first time. But uh, but uh, I was just glad that it worked out. And the reason that the five of us were ordered in was to go on the fourth war loan drive to talk about our experiences and what it was like like in combat. Let's go back to the combat. Was it shelling and gunfire day and night? Was there any kind of reprieve? <laughs> oh no! As soon the shelling stopped as soon as we landed. There wasn't room enough for, for shelling. Now, airdrops, yes. Uh, that was the beauty of, of, of air support in those days. You could lay on your back and have a map in front of you with squares on it, and you could be having trouble in square number 714. And you could go right up to that guy flying overhead who had been circling around, waiting for a request, and you'd say, we need some <coughs> bombardment on square number 714, and down he would come and drop the stuff. Nobody would be there other than Japanese. So <coughs> you can't do that today with modern jet aircraft. Uh, they have different ways of gaining their targets and what have you, but, but <coughs> they don't have enough fuel to be able to go round and round and round like our fighters of that day did have. And so... Uh, uh, battalion commanders could call down airstrikes at their will. That was very, very handy. How did you, as a photographer, now I assume you carried sidearm or you had a rifle, but <clears throat> everybody else has got a gun, they're defending themselves, they're shooting. You're not. Did you feel at all vulnerable? <clears throat> did you feel no. naked or, you know, with not having a gun or? Uh, like I said earlier, perhaps, uh, uh, when I was being interviewed by by uh, Major Crow, I said that I knew if I needed a rifle, I'd bend down and pick one up because there would be enough wounded that rifles would be dropped and I'd probably have to scurry for ammunition because I wouldn't be carrying the right ammo. But uh, before we left New Zealand, uh, several of, our, of, of us convinced our big boss, uh, who was not a photo officer at that time, but well, uh, our immediate boss was a, was a photo officer, but the big boss was the intelligence officer who was our commander. And uh, we convinced him that we should have pistols, that to have a rifle flapping off our shoulder while we're still trying to carry gear, shoot, and everything else, it would be just a total, total mess. So he agreed with us, and, and uh, they ordered that the, uh, that, uh, the arsenal give us uh, all pistols and men. We had a man who had been transferred to us from the 1st Division who had been on Guadalcanal and was quite experienced, but he had also been a state trooper in, uh, in uh, Louisiana and had gone to the FBI school on small arms fire. And so we set up in New Zealand and up in the hillside behind us uh, a perfect range. Uh, we, there were pathways that sheep, sheep had cut through that hillside. And we used those pathways, and as they went around a corner, something would jump out at us, and that's what we had to shoot. And that's the kind of a thing that, that he set up for us. His name was Ernest Diet. And uh, it was very helpful because uh, normally in training, you just got, with the, with the, with the uh, 45, you just got some intermediate type of training, how to hold it and how to shoot it. They didn't two hold in those days. Everything was single hold. And uh, so... Uh, uh, Diet shot us how to shoot from, and I had everybody go out uh, doing it, uh, from all of us senior NCOs to the lowliest private, you know, because they'd all have a pistol. He taught us how to shoot from every position, prone, sitting, kneeling, standing, 
and through the holster. And his, his admonition, the way the FBI was teaching it in those days, was get three or four shots off without being sure of where you're aiming at, but just let the guy know he's being shot at to scare him enough so that he tries to figure out should he run, should he turn, should he do this, or should he grab for his gun, or what, because he, he hasn't been expecting you either. And then by the fourth shot, you probably ought to hit him. And, uh, but the shooting through the holster was a great gag because you didn't have to take it out of the holster. You didn't have to bring it up. All you do is just boom like that. So, um, how did you become a photographer? Was that something you volunteered for? Were you chosen for it? Was it something you wanted to do? Were you happy with that decision? To become a motion picture photographer was definitely my desire. And it was fur furthered by the fact that in those days they always told you to read your bulletin board every single day because it told you what your unit was doing and what your Marine Corps was doing. And a bulletin came on the bulletin board back in 1939, late in 39, and uh, it said that there would be uh, training established up at the March of Time for some Navy and Marine personnel. No experience required. So I applied for it and was turned down because I had no experience. <laughs> Typical of, of a military situation. I later learned out why and it was perfectly good reason. But uh, then I applied for it again. It was six months. I applied it the six months period the second time. And I applied the third time. I was working up at the Navy Office Navy of Public Relations at the old Navy building on Constitution Avenue. And there was a large influx of reserve people coming in. The president had ordered up the reserve. He thought something was going to happen. This was 1940, 41. And it was in 41, actually. And, and so uh, uh, a lieutenant came in to head up the newsreel section. That would be the section to release newsreel film to the public. And his name was Alan Brown. And Alan Brown had been a director at the March of Time. Now, this is circumstances. So one time I told him, I went down to his office, I told him, I said, I've tried two times, now I've got a request in the third time. I hope I don't get turned down. But I just thought I'd let you know, and, and uh, maybe you can guide me or advise me some way, somehow. So uh, about, uh, oh, I'd say the 20th of September in 41, I was turned down for the October 1st class again. And my, my boss, who was the executive officer, Lieutenant Gordon, came in and said, Norm, you've been turned down again, I'm sorry to say. And so I went back to see Alan Brown, the lieutenant. And Alan, I've been turned down. I didn't say Alan in those days. I said, Lieutenant, I've been turned down. And uh, for the third time, and he said, well, Louis de Rochemont, the producer, is going to be in town tomorrow, and I've got to get some film over to him. And so I'll give it to you, and you take it over to him, and I'll tell him your story. So I went over to the hotel, gave him the film, sat down. He had two Norwegian cameramen with him that were up from or down from uh, Canada, guys who had escaped from the Germans and were learning photography. Uh, so uh, uh, I spent an hour with him, and he, and he was very nice. And, and uh, I went, went back, and I thought, well, that was over with. And I told Alan Brown, I said, I don't think much of anything happened. It was very pleasant and very enjoyable. He was very nice. And the day before October 1st, whatever it was, Lieutenant Gordon comes back into my office, and he says, Norm, what in the Christ have you been doing? I said, why? He said, I got orders to transfer you immediately to New York for a march of time. And he said, not only that, they didn't indicate any replacement for you. <laughs> that was bothering him more than my going. And uh, so I went back to see Lieutenant Brown. I said, what happened? He said, well, I'll tell you a story. And this is the most interesting part. Louis de Rochemont was an ensign in World War I in a destroyer you know, off the Dardanelles. And... Uh, his bunkmate, another ensign, was now a rear admiral in the Navy, was chief of naval personnel, and it was through him that Louis set up the school originally and convinced him that, yes, his cameramen were taught to take pictures, but not to tell stories with his cameras, with their cameras. So he called up the admiral and said, do you think you, one of your guys could call the Marine Corps detailer and see if they could get enough money for another guy to come up, and this is the guy I want. So all based back onto World War I was my acceptance into learning how to shoot motion pictures. 
and it set up my life for the rest of my life. Now that's a longer story than you ever needed, but uh, but you know, I've been on the crest of a wave ever since. It's been like a surfer that's been on a surfboard and, and he's never never come off the board. It just keeps on rolling. What's the best thing about being a combat photographer? Well, the best thing the best thing about being a combat photographer is is seeing your your work used usefully. Uh, if it's to tell the public what's happening. Uh, a very important thing happened on the Tarawa film. When the film was edited and was ready for release, it was shown to the president because for the first time it had dead bodies floating in the water back and forth at the beach as the little waves would come in. And uh, like I say, this was just before Thanksgiving or now it was before Christmas because we'd made, the film had been made and <clears throat> about to be released. And uh, so the president was not too sure that that ought to be released. And the leading time, lifetime correspondent in the Pacific was Bob Sherrod, who had been in already three major battles in the Pacific, and two of them with the Marine Corps. And uh, he had also been a White House correspondent, and the president knew him well. And every time he would come back from a combat battle someplace to be debriefed by his time life people so they could write appropriate stories, the president would always ask him to come down to debrief him as well because he couldn't travel around and uh, his wife couldn't go into combat zones. She, did, she went the rest of the world to tell him what was going on, but not that. So Bob Sherrod briefed the president after every battle, along with everybody else that briefed him, but, but was, had sort of a distaff voice in this sort of thing. And the question was raised, the president said, do you think we ought to release this film? And Bob had seen the film. He said, yes, by all means, because the public does not know the extent of the fighting we are now in in the Pacific. And they've got to know it. And so Roosevelt agreed and released the film. So it also released the rules that existed on how to handle dead in pictures. And don't stop the photography from being taken, basically. Let the brass at headquarters figure out what to do with it. So the, you didn't have any specific orders not to shoot the dead? You no, were just no. shooting. Okay. And what happened with this film um, subsequently? Well, the film uh, was shown to the public uh, in December of 41, uh, and, uh, I, pardon me, in December of 43. And, uh, and so uh, uh, it was nominated for an Academy Award and won the Academy Award for the most outstanding documentary short subject of 1944. And uh, we had an in-joke in our organization that we were going to get an Academy Award uh, to beat uh, John Ford out. Ford had gotten two Academy Awards, one for a recreation of Pearl Harbor, which he'd done in the studio, uh, and, uh, which was a 1942 award. And he won a 1943 award uh, for his documentation of, of uh, Midway. He was in the Battle of Midway. He actually got wounded there. But he was the big, big uh, photo chief, you know. The Navy had uh, made him a commander, and uh, he had. I'd met most of his crew on, the, on, our, on my earlier times in Hollywood, and you know they were grips and cameramen and directors and sound people and everybody out of the industry who may or might have been drafted, and they had the opportunity to come into his unit, and so uh, uh, this was our competition, so to speak. Here we were, a bunch of kids. And here's all this expertise, and we're going to do as good as they did. Well, we did. <laughs> Tell me about more of that footage that you got at Tarawa. Tell me uh, any one, I mean, I know we got we talked about the shot of the enemy and, and us in the same frame. Anything else that kind of stands out in your mind is like, um, you know, that feels remarkable or particularly haunts you maybe or anything that way? Uh, for the film I shot, now, you've got to realize I, I only shot about 3,700 feet, 37 rolls at the most. Uh, that's but not much time, actually, in, in, uh, uh, considering everything else. But, but um, uh, I think all of it was impressed deeply on my mind uh, to the point where it's difficult to pick out any one given scene, short of 
something like the, the one that we talked about before. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, liked, I liked the attack on the big blockhouse because it was a very obvious target. It was something everybody could see. Uh, and uh, uh, there was just an awful lot going on. Up until this time, everything was pretty much hidden. You'd see a couple of guys run out here, see them firing there, you know, but you couldn't see what they were firing at or, or anything of that nature. But you had to shoot it because this is what they were doing. So I, I wouldn't call that mundane, but it was, it was typical of the average kind of thing that you would, would get. And it's unusual that you get something unusual. Did you have any near misses yourself where you shot at or, or did you have to pick up your, pull your gun out at all at any point? Or? No, not that I know of. Uh, the, uh, uh, I developed a theory, you know, uh, in movies uh, here uh, about Indians and, and, and the Westerners fighting them, that if somebody was crazy walking around, the Indians would avoid him and not bother him, not try to kill him or what have you. And several of the trappers would come off going into that mode if they were looked like they were going to be captured or something. Well, I figured the Japanese, you know, back in the early days, the Asiatics came over that ice bridge up there above Alaska and came down into our western part of, of, of the United States and formed a lot of the Indian nations as we know them today. So I figured they've got the same philosophy and they probably thought I was crazy and they weren't going to shoot me. And that's just an end joke, kind of a little bit. Well, actually, it's not bad. Can you some, can you tell me that a little bit more succinctly? Can you, in a, in a way, can you just put it? Yeah, I think I think I can. Okay. Uh, I was in an area where I was walking around, standing up most of the time. Once in a while, on my knee to get a shot. But while everybody was crouched down, I was standing up. So I made a perfect target. Uh, so did Kelly, who was with me, and. Uh, Neither one of us got shot during the battle. And why? Well, I think the Japanese probably thought I was crazy and they didn't want to shoot at me. And so, so I left it at that. <laughs> um, was it just constant gunfire? I mean, just a small area. I mean, to rack up 6,000 dead or 5,000, whatever the numbers were, I mean, it would just seem like it just, I mean, that's my perspective, but I'm not there. Put me in the scene. I mean, what, well, it, what, you smell, what are the smells like? You starting to, you know, are you starting to smell dead body? Are you smelling gunpowder? What's the temperatures like? Is it, uh, you know, just kind of give me all the, the kind of the, 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 the sound, sights and sounds, so to speak. Well, there was always a chatter of something going on. Whether it was a machine gun, ours, theirs, you could tell the difference in the sound. Uh, you could tell a difference in the sound of the rifles uh, firing as well. <coughs> the uh, hold it for a minute. I got to get a just to loosen my. <coughs> okay, get back on that. Uh, there was an awful lot of chatter going on uh, with weapons being fired, and uh, uh, you hoped that you wouldn't walk into them either. Fire from your own group, as well as. Uh, what else was going on and, and uh, I knew generally speaking where we were supposed to go in other words where the the troops were once they get over the seawall uh, what their job was and, and uh, actually was to go across the air strip over to the other side of the island and secure all of that and then the lower end of the island which I mentioned earlier people could walk off of and out to the next island to go down and make sure that nobody escaped through that end we didn't want any Japanese troops winding up and heavy concentrations on any of the other islands. The final island up at the end chain was called Apimama, and there were Japanese up there, and so we had to go in and take care of them, but it was a very small contingent, so it wasn't much of a problem. But we didn't want any of that kind of thing, so uh, the Japanese really didn't come out. There were no bonsai charges or anything of that nature, and, and uh, so it... Uh, uh, it, it was just, I think, sort of a, uh, a very ordinary uh, sound level, but the smell on the island became very bad. Uh, and uh, uh, the sun beat down. Uh, what happens to a body who lay, that lays out in the sun 
it begins to bloat up and it gets up. You see the shirts will be tight, the pants will be tight, everything will be tight. And uh, the people who did uh, uh, the rescue of bodies that were in the water, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but I can't just offhand, but the, uh, uh, they'd be around in a boat and they'd be have to be careful, they'd have a boat hook and trying to hook into the clothing to be able to pull the person aboard, not to pierce the guy, because if any did, let all that gas out of him, he'd sink. So they had to be very careful. So that's how. It, so the smell was bad. There's no question about it. That sun beating down on anybody that was dead, and there were a lot of them laying around. And uh, you know, from occa occasionally, uh, some Japanese would come out and try to charge somebody when they'd see three or four guys around, realizing that they were in an impossible position. And this was a way they could be killed, but they might take somebody with them. So there were bodies there. And uh, as far as our guys were concerned, uh, uh, you know, they, they pulled them all in. They didn't leave anybody laying around. But nevertheless, uh, there wasn't any real good capability of getting most of them off right away either. And so uh, uh, they undoubtedly uh, caused a little bit to the odor content on the island. But uh, we only brought in about 14 Japs alive. Now there was a large contingent of, of uh, Koreans there who were used as laborers. And it just so happened that the day we secured the island was the day that, that uh, Roosevelt, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and, uh, and uh, Churchill declared that, that, uh, that Korea would be a free nation now out from under Japanese control. So uh, anyway, uh, it, uh, it, was, it was not a very pleasurable place to be. Um, how many troops did we send in overall? And, and how, what percentage? Well, there were, there were um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, we had three landing zones. We had actually four. Uh, a battalion has got about a thousand men in it, so there are about four battalions ashore, and there may be and then support troops. Uh, we brought in tanks, uh, we brought in uh, artillery, and so they supplemented those four thousand people, perhaps that were in the battalions, and uh, it. Uh, what, what did the Marines learn from this? You said that they had learned something from this battle. And yeah. if you can possibly put in context, and you can take these as two separate questions, do you fear Tarawa has gotten kind of a fair shake in history, and why isn't it being more uh, talked about, or why, why has it been kind of, um, you know, undermined, or undermined, undermined, under, more than, you know, why, why has it been, you know, um, something that's less talked about in the in history books or on uh, the History Channel, so to speak? Now, Tarawa has a, an unusual history in that it was, to the best of my knowledge, the first successful amphibious landing against a heavily fortified beachhead in the history of, of world fighting. Uh, there were a number, of, a number of, of battles along that line that didn't succeed, and Gallipoli is the best known one. That's one Churchill ordered. And he damn near lost his job as, as the Secretary of the Navy or whatever the Minister of the Navy that, that he had. And uh, because they just uh, murdered the British troops when, uh, when they got on the, on the uh, shore. So it proved to us that we could do it, but it also taught us a lot of lessons that though we thought that we knew them all in the sense of... Uh, of uh, war gaming, but nothing ever goes like it's planned. And uh, the very fact that we didn't get any troops ashore after the first wave for the first day and almost a half. Now the, the troops that were in the boats that were sent back and, and they originally thought they'd bring them in at night and the, and the unit commander said, no, uh, we'll be shooting each other if we do that. They didn't come in until about 10.20 the next morning. Now, this was the bulk of the fighting force. And so 
they had to do, in a sense, the mop-up of what we had started, uh, or what the first waves had started uh, the day before. And uh, all the cameramen were out there in the boats, uh, rocking around. The pool cameraman, uh, Don Senek from 20th Century Fox, was floating around in a boat overnight. Didn't get in until noon the next day. And I was the only movie man on the beach. I didn't know it in the beginning, but I couldn't find anybody, so I figured that something had happened, and uh, maybe they were dead or whatever. But uh, and there was a still man who was with me as well, uh, Bill Kelleher. So the three of us were just about the only guys on the beach that had cameras in the first day and a half. So, uh, as I say, nothing ever goes like you think it's going to go, even though you plan it well. Fortunately, everybody is trained how to, how to act. Now, I don't think that, that, uh, that the Pacific battles gained the same prominence as, uh, as uh, the European war did. And, and, and the reason for that is that, that we were f fighting a single enemy. Uh, secondly, there wasn't a tremendous uh, group of people in this country that were Japanese. Uh, and what was, it was mostly on the West Coast. We didn't really know them in New York or, or the rest of the places, maybe in a restaurant, but, but, but not really know them. But we had, you know, Germans and French and, and, and Irish and, <laughs> and Spanish and what have you, people in our country who had relatives in the old country. So there's a big tie in there. And, and uh, D-Day was a big day. And uh, I've heard a rumor, and I'm going to say it's a rumor so that it doesn't get misconstrued. And if you use it, you should say it's a, it's a rumor. The Churchill was having difficulty convincing both Eisenhower and his own leaders, military leaders, to start the landing on the French coast because they were afraid the Germans, I say afraid, but they were concerned that the Germans were too well ensconced, would just annihilate any landing force that was making an attempt. But Churchill kept his eye on what was happening in the Pacific and watched our battle and saw that we had done it under the similar circumstances as it would be on the, on the, on the coast of uh, France, then turned to Eisenhower and his own command and said, well, the Marines did it at terror. I guess we could do it in France. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it makes an awfully good story. And uh, if, if it is true, it means that the influence of that battle was wider than we had thought. And someday I hope that I can find uh, a, 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 an historian of Churchill's that might be able to determine whether such a thing happened in, in, in that sense. From kind of a... I'm going to have to stop you for a second. I'm going to change drives. Huh? Um, take me on a kind of a global view. I, I read a quote um, from you somewhere that said something to the effect that I guess with your experience that the Japanese would never have quit. And, you know, from your perspective, you know, the war would have just gotten bigger and bloodier and it was just, you know, take, take yeah, me... You, you're talking about the use of the atomic yeah. bomb? Yeah. Okay. Take, take me, you know, and if you're not comfortable talking about that, whether I use oh, it or not, I don't know. But just kind of take me from, you know, how that kind of changed your worldview, having that experience um, fighting the Japanese on Tarawa. Uh, well, let's see, fighting the Japanese on Tarawa. Uh, I had one director at the Army Pictorial Center get mad at me when I was narrating a film because he said, you have no anger in your voice. And I said, well, I wasn't angry at anything. Why should I be angry now? <laughs> he said, well, you should have been mad at the Japs. I said, well, I wasn't mad at them. <laughs> and I said, it wouldn't have done me any good to be mad at them. And uh, uh, they were there like we were there. They were ordered by their big bosses to go to that island and protect it. We were ordered by our big bosses to go to that island and take it. See? So why be, you know, if you're going to be mad, you have to be mad at Tojo or, or, uh, or General Marshall or somebody of that nature because they're the guys that are doing all the ordering. Now, yes, the Japanese uh, troops uh, very often did things that were abhorrent to us, the cutting off of heads, an officer with a saber. But it wasn't unusual. They'd cut off their own heads sometimes if somebody was really not acting correctly in, in their estimation. But uh, that was a thing for our country boys to, to uh, and I say that because 
most of our fighting force. You realize we had six million people under arms during World War II, and a goodly portion of them came out of the country. And uh, that's why Marshall called uh, uh, Frank to come in and, and made him a major uh, to make a whole series of films of why we fight. Because our people didn't know why we were in this war exactly. Yeah, the more sophisticated ones in New York or Boston or, or Philadelphia or somebody like knew, but the rest of the guys were workers in, in, in plants, a few steel plants or, or automobile plants, or they were farmers. And they didn't know anything about the world in, in, re, in true reality. So uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was the way things were. And the Japanese on the West Coast is another, another story, but uh, the, uh, that I got involved in, but the, the Japanese would not have quit if we'd come in with all of our forces, Army, Marines, Navy, and Air Corps, until they were all dead, one way or the other. I don't think that the, the Emperor would have ever issued an order, uh, or any of his top military commanders would have issued an order to lay down your arms. The, uh, uh, we were told, we were planning the coverage, <coughs> photographic coverage of our landing in Japan. Now we're going to have six marine divisions, three air wings, four air wings, uh, all involved in this. And so we were planning the coverage so that we didn't duplicate each other because we we're going to be far from each with locations. We didn't know what the other guy would do it. So we're sitting there in sync pack planning all this. And the Navy was planning what they were going to do. And then one night I was sitting at an open air theater at the Navy Yard and the projector went off. Now that wasn't unusual. Uh, all through the war, projection machines would break down. And everybody yelled at the guy, turn the damn projector back on. Well, he came on the PA system. He said, I've been told to inform you that an atomic bomb was dropped on, the, on Hiroshima in Japan. So we looked at each other and said, so what? What the hell is, you know, who cares? Turn on the damn projector. None of us knew what an atomic bomb was. That project was kept so secret and so tightly under wraps that even some of the men who loaded it on the damned aircraft didn't know what it was. So uh, I found out the next morning, of course, when I checked into the office to see what the hell was going on. and. Uh, and then three days later, they dropped out of Nagasaki, and then they said the war was over. But in going there, in the 2nd Division, in Nagasaki, uh, one of the places that I went to was the police station, because they had collected, under the Emperor's orders and MacArthur's orders, all the weapons that could hurt somebody. It could be a sickle or a sigh or a lance, or a halberd out of, out of the uh, medieval days, or a bow and arrow, or anything like that, you know. And up in the room in which they do their kendai stick stuff, practicing, it would be just loaded with anything from swords to knives to harry carry knives, or whatever, you know. And I looked at that and I thought, Jesus Christ, everybody from a child this big could have a weapon that we would have to fight one way or the other. I mean, you know, you could walk down a street and a kid would come out of a bush and plant one of those things in the middle of your back. <laughs> we didn't have armor in those days of protection anyway. So uh, uh, they were ready to fight to the death and it would have been a horrible mess for for, to, on that whole island. It, it would be just like, you know, if it, in, in Iraq today, if you went in to kill everybody and everybody had something like a collision, you know, a, a Russian rifle or whatever sitting in there, uh, it, uh, it would not be good. When you left Tarawa after three days, what was your feeling about that? Did you know you guys succeeded? You, you, the Japanese had surrendered? I mean, how did, what, tell me about the uh, end of that battle. Well, as far as Taro was concerned at the end, uh, it was, uh, I guess probably the best way to explain it would be that uh, 
that uh, there wasn't any end. You just walked away. Uh, there wasn't anybody left to fight or do anything with. We had nine or ten prisoners out of the whole total garrison. So everybody knew it was over. And uh, we raised a flag. That, uh, that probably clinched the deal. When the flag went up, that said, we'd won. And uh, so uh, once again, as a photographer, we were busy photographing the people leaving the island. And uh, there's a famous shot of a, of a, a lieutenant colonel uh, wishing everybody good luck and patting them on the, on the shoulder as the guys walk off to the pier to go get into boats to go out to a ship. And uh, so uh, photographers, uh, in a case like that, would be the last to get aboard the boat because they're photographing whatever happens and, 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 and doing this. And uh, uh, I was just happy to get aboard the boat so I could take a shower and, uh, and, and shave and get cleaned up a little bit. And uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I never went aboard a ship, but I called on the executive officer, regardless of my rank. I was a corporal when I first went aboard ship and told him that what my duty was. And I said, in case of general quarters, I do not want to be constrained to down below. I want to be up on the flying bridge. Can I get your OK on that? because I want to be able to photograph whatever the hell's happening. It may go nowhere, it may sink with the ship and with me, but if it doesn't, there'll be a picture of what happens. And they always agreed with me. So I was always up on the flying bridge whenever general quarters went. And that was a self-protection thing because coming from a seagoing town, I know how ships handle in, in water, and uh, uh, I'd figured ways the minute I got aboard ship on how I could get off the ship in case the ship was damaged and not be caught in the prop which is still going around and all that other kind of stuff. And uh, flying bridge was about as good as any. Of course, you, you may be 40 feet up from the water, but uh, you're out away from the ship because it sticks out on the side. <laughs> so that was my ulterior motive, but uh, but I also wanted to be there in case something happened. But were you the last one off the island or one of the last ones? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me that again. Tell me. Well, we, uh, and, and again, try to. What I need from you, if you can, I, I need. I need a conclusion. And the way we're ending these things, we're kind of needing it to kind of end. And I need a little bit of space. So, if you can, in between thoughts, give me some space. If I want to edit, I can stop mm -hmm. there. If you keep going, I'm going to have a hard time ending the piece. So, kind okay. of wrap me up here a little bit and try to tell me you were the last one. Maybe put some final thoughts into that. Um, you know, leaving the island, you look back, what'd you see? What did it look like? Was it smoking? Was it just still dead bodies? Just kind of put a perspective on that. And again, try to keep in mind, um, you know, give me some space if you can, just to break it. So if we want All right. to cut, we can. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of little story okay. uh, anecdotes. <clears throat> when the battle was, was over, it was going to be some time before troop ships would be able to be there to, uh, uh, get us all off and, and uh, take us to wherever we were going. And the uh, reason for that being that as soon as the troop ships had unloaded us, they had gone away because they, in case a Japanese fighting force came up, they would be in the way. They couldn't fight back. They didn't have the armament for it. So they disappeared out of sight, and so they had to be brought back to pick up the troops and, and uh, carry them off. <coughs> but while we were waiting for the ships to come back, a group of us went up to the next island, which was just like being in paradise. Uh, we lived in a, uh, uh, there were three or four of us, I think, and we lived in, in a nice, great, big grass-covered hut and that was open on the sides, and, and the natives were very nice to us, the Gilbertees. Actually, it was called the Gilbert Islands uh, in the English uh, version. And uh, uh, they were very nice to us. So we stayed there for two or three days, and then uh, finally, uh, uh, they got the word that everything was going to move off. So then we went back to take pictures of what was happening. And, uh, and we did that. And, and uh, we were about the last to get aboard ship. And, and uh, uh, you know, to look back at the island, this, as, as we did, standing there in the water waiting for the boat to come up and pick us up, uh, that... Uh, uh, so much had transpired in that short period of time, and so many people were hurt and wounded, and 
and uh, it sinks in on you at a time like that, that that such a thing has happened and you you sort of wonder why you know why, how did we get into this situation that what brought us into it and uh, so uh, uh, this comes with later knowledge much later knowledge but uh, the uh, uh, it, it just leaves it a question in your mind as to how man gets himself into a, into a situation where you got to kill everybody to to succeed. I don't know whether I answered your question or not. But yeah, that's good. We'll keep going a little bit. Yeah. Um, again, when you end with something nice like that, take a little bit of space there, just so we have. But that was good. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, philosophically, um, did it affect you at all? Yeah. Did it change you? Did you leave that island? You know, uh, kind of <clears throat> now you kind of a veteran. You you've been to combat. <clears throat> After a battle like that is over, all you want to do, and I think this includes everybody, no matter how what their rank or position, is to get back into the safety of something real. Uh, and of course, the ship is the only thing that you're going to get into in a situation like that. But most of the ships that we had were converted cruise ships to take us, and they still had the accommodations aboard, like cruise ships. And it was like stepping into a little bit of America. And uh, uh, so it, um, uh, it it was very, very nice. I, I think that's the way to put it. Uh, true enough, the the, uh, the average trooper had to, had to go down into the hold of the ship uh, because that's where they had bunks six high to be able to take troops where they're going. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the Cape Billy get into a shower, getting a good meal rather than something out of a can and everything else uh, uh, helps you out. You, you reminisce a little bit about what you've been through. Uh, I was glad to have come out of it uh, doing my job. Going in, I wondered whether I'd be able to do it. Now I know I did know how to do it, and that I've got it done. I think that, good. Yeah. That was good. Um, I just want to make sure, that was good, by the way, thank you. Let me just make sure I got all my, to really kind of make yourself a target. And tell me a couple of instances about that, one through the water, one kind of just in battle, and <laughs> why you think you were able to survive that. Being a cameraman in combat is like being somebody with a target on his back, mainly because you cannot take pictures laying down all the time. Yes, you can take some, but not very much. So consequently, you have to walk or crouch perhaps or what have you through the battle scene. And uh, uh, you know that you're doing this and, and uh, uh, you just hope the enemy thinks that you're a crazy person and they shouldn't bother with you and let you go. Uh, I, I walked in through water watching people getting hit in the same water that I was in and going down, but uh, nothing, nothing came my way. Tell me about these nine millimeters that hit. What did you see when they hit the, the ships? Um, what, what was your? Did you did you shoot any of that, or that was just something that you saw? No, after? no. It, uh, it it you know it happened. Uh, let's say the uh, nine millimeter guns that the Japanese had on the other side of the island were aimed specifically at the reef, where the boats would have to stop and drop their ramp, and when they did so. A nine millimeter shell would land in the landing craft and explode and blow everybody to pieces. And this happened for a number of boats until the beach officers, officers on the beach in command of the battalions, radioed out to the ship and said, Don't send any more boats in. And uh, uh, that was really uh, probably the most gruesome thing that I saw, because uh, those poor guys just never had a chance. And uh, nobody came out of the boats alive. 
tell, tell me about, do you think with your film, and, and kind of, you, you hinted at it, that it was the first time kind of showing dead bodies, dead bodies floating around, do you think that kind of broke the ice in a way, um, you know, for <laughs> filmmakers to kind of, now it's okay to show that? I mean, do you feel that was really leading? Uh, well, the well, film, film shot on Tarawa uh, was a first. Uh, as, as young kids, in a sense, we didn't realize it at that time. But it was a first, and uh, the powers that be back here in Washington realized it, and that's why they wanted to get it out to the public, because it showed what combat was really like. It showed it up close, dirty. And uh, so the, the film had a very, very strong purpose. Uh, later elements of it were used for training. And, uh, and put into training films and, and uh, to show how you do this or how you do, don't do this. Okay. But uh, it, uh, it Sorry, was... The uh, audio on that was really bad. Oh, this is what was going on upstairs. Um, what was the name of the film? Uh, the film that was edited uh, at the end of the war was called With the Marines at Tarawa. And uh, it, uh, it was a 20 minute uh, uh, documentary style job and uh, it was in color and they took my black and white film and tinted it a rosy hue so that there wouldn't be too much of a shock in the cutting and the editing period of it uh, uh, when it uh, mixed in with the color. It also, the fact that, of course this gets into another long story, but, but we were the first ones to really shoot color in a battle. And you got to remember, at the time we were doing this, there wasn't anything going on in Europe. There was in Africa, but not in Europe. And so consequently, uh, uh, we, were we started answering the war in the Pacific and uh, first to fight the old Marine tradition. Uh, and so it, uh, uh, we really started a lot of things. We, we really started the color thing in motion picture work, mainly because when I came back and told the people who were doing the buying of the equipment, cameras were too heavy. And the little Bell & Howell auto load with three lenses on the turret it was that big and about that long. And you open up the back, throw it in a, in a magazine, 50-foot mag, you could carry dozens of those on you compared to the, the rolls of film for the IMO. So <clears throat> there were a lot of little things that came out of this from the standpoint of photography, much less very important things from the standpoints of of operational work and, and tactics and techniques that were used in the military sense. Tell me one more time, and I think this will actually cover it. Your job was as important, maybe if not more important, than the guy that was actually shooting somebody because it had all these other potential positive aspects, you know, the historical value, the training value. Right. Kind of tell me that you told me once, I want to hear it one more time again succinctly. Um, you know, why you felt your job was important. And, and um, you know, you've got the satisfaction, you feel you did your job well, and the impact that you had. Having been taught at the March of Time in New York, which was the premier newsreel organization of the day, <clears throat> which only put out a release once a month, but it was a half hour release, and it was dedicated to one story. Uh, taught me that there was a big lesson to be learned in photography and uh, that photography had far-reaching aspects to it that were not easily identifiable or visioned right at the source except by photographers and uh, so very often uh, you would run into a Marine up on the front line who would ask why you were there. And then you would have to, in a sense, so that he wouldn't feel like you were an interloper, tell him that what you were shooting was as important as what he was shooting. Because you were showing how it was done by the virtue of photography, good or bad, and, uh, and that it had a tremendous results capability in training or in public release. And... Uh, we had to keep the public informed. If you don't have the subject out there of the war in front of the public, 
then they don't understand why you're doing it. Did it change your having that combat experience? Did it change your mind about war or combat at all? <clears throat> well, after you've been through something like that, you wonder why. You wonder why man does that to each other. Why they can't decide uh, to be able to talk and, and and work things out. But I have realized in later years that this country, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to understand or have the capability of understanding the cultures of other people. And I think that's where we're getting into trouble with Japan. Uh, yes, they, they were going through Asia and doing things that we didn't like, and uh, maybe we had to stop them, but, uh, but uh, we didn't talk to them because we didn't have anybody much that could talk Japanese. And that's one of the reasons why everybody was taken off the West Coast. After, after, uh, that's my phone. Is there going to be a machine? Uh, no, no. It, um, that's right, my wife must have gotten it. But uh, the, uh, uh, the reason that, that we took everybody off the West Coast is uh, and this was told to me by the number three guy in the FBI because I was working with him at the March of Time on training films for the FBI. And I asked him a question. I said, why isn't this unconstitutional that you take the, all this action? He said, yes, it is. But he said, we have absolutely no protection on the West Coast. The fleet that was supposed to protect the West Coast is now sunk in Pearl Harbor. And just a short while ago, a Japanese sub surfaced off of Long Beach and fired at the oil wells. Scared the life out of everybody. The coast, and, and you'd have to realize the coast in those days. I had driven it from San Francisco down to L.A. There was nobody. Hardly anybody. Maybe little villages here and there. But absolutely nobody. We had no troops on the west coast. The only troops that the Army had were training down in, in uh, Louisiana and using broomsticks for rifles and and uh, and stovepipe for mortars. And what we had in the Marine Corps or, or, or the or the military at that time was a Marine training base down there at, at uh, San Diego, and the Army had uh, <coughs> some few people up in the Presidio on the island <coughs> in uh, San Francisco. Couldn't done anything, so. The public thought that the Japanese were coming the next day to land. And the word quisling was very, very prominent. Do you, are you familiar with All right. Quisling was a Norwegian who helped the Germans come into his country. And it's considered with traitors. The biggest, if you said he's a quisling, he's the biggest traitor in the world. Well, everything that the Japanese were reading in those days about world events was coming from Japan because the first generation Japanese couldn't read English or speak it very well. And so they received all of their magazines, their newspapers, and whatever else from Japan. So what kind of subliminal message was coming through? We didn't have any linguists that could discern on that in quantity to, to be of any good. So it was finally decided that the safest thing to do was to move them off the coast and put them in the camps in Nevada and wherever else they put them. And uh, they, uh, I've, I've written this story a couple of times. It's been in the post, and, and uh, one woman called me up. She said, I was a sophomore at UCLA, Long Beach. I'm so glad you wrote what you did, because nobody understands what it was like to have those Japanese shooting at us, <laughs> you know. And so uh, uh, anyway, that's a diversion from the whole story. But, but uh, uh Afterwards, I got got into into uh, thinking about things like that, and and I, and I think that we could have taken care of the Japanese thing if we had had some people who understood their culture and what they're doing. We didn't understand the Vietnamese culture. We didn't understand the Korean culture. <laughs> so, and, and we certainly haven't understood the Arab culture. So uh, I think that that's what happens all the way up the line. And uh, I'm sure we've got people who would say, 
I'm dumb to say that, but uh, but uh, I'm sure there are people who are fluent in Arabic out there. But but look at what they've been doing, kicking the gays out of the army, the one only ones who speak yeah. Arabic. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so yeah, apparently we haven't learned lessons from history. No, see, so uh, that we keep repeating ourselves over and over and over again. I want to just because I know we, we've taken a lot more of your time than we anticipated. But uh, this is all very interesting and, and fascinating. Um, I want to just touch on one more highlight just to kind of review okay. and review succinctly on the island. Um, just tell me a little bit about, again, you as a photographer doing your job. What was the day like? You were following troops around. You were kind of just behind the uh, lines. Just tell me a little bit about what you did on a day-to-day -day on Tarawa. Well, every morning after we left, we only had two mornings afterward, but I, I paid pretty close attention to what my major was doing, the battalion commander. And several times I would ask him uh, for advice and guidance on where things were happening because he was in contact, radio contact with, with a company commander or platoon commander, what have you. So uh, then in the mornings when, they, when he'd call in the, the his executive officer, who was another major, Bill Chamberlain, uh, and maybe some of the senior NCOs or what have you, to discuss what's in front of them for the day. I would listen to that, so I'd have some idea of where, where they were going to go. And then I would go out and find that organization or that group of people and, and try to see just exactly what was happening and, and photograph whatever was going on. And uh, that's the way the day would start, and that's the way it ended. And, and uh, as soon as it got dark, there wasn't anything I could do because I couldn't shoot with anything. So I had established a small command post with my back up to the seawall and uh, actually dug a hole for the chaplain, too. He was next to us. Uh, I figured we were in pretty good company. But uh, the, uh, uh, it was just a matter of looking for st subject stories. What I was trying to do was tell stories with the film rather than just random shooting of things. And uh, so uh, I hope that's the way it turned out. And of course, I haven't seen all the film that I shot. I've only seen what has been edited, and so I just don't know, you know, what the so, uh, result. So, sounds and, like it's about time to go and get that film. Yeah. Well, yeah, in piece. fact, the uh, the stuff I shot on Iwo was only on my, my landing and going up to the top of the the pile of uh, of uh, junk up to Motoyama Number One. Uh, I'd never seen that, and uh, finally they found it in the archives, and. So I don't have a copy of it, but uh, but it. Uh, overall, how would you just wrap up your career in a couple of sentences? My overall career. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tie your service to your country and and, and, and your contribution. Well, I uh, I stayed with the Marine Corps after the war because it had been decimated as a result of the end of the war. Uh, a good example is that. There was a lieutenant colonel in charge sitting at headquarters of all the photographic services, and he called a lieutenant, first lieutenant in, to talk with him one, Sunday, one Monday morning and said, Carl, you are now going to be the photographic officer of the Marine Corps, from a lieutenant colonel to a lieutenant. Because he likes all the other officers and the other men that we had taken from. We started out as maybe 12 people, and now we had over 600 people by the end of the war. But we had two studios. We had a big studio in L.A., actually in Camp Pendleton, and one at Quantico to make training films. We had all the you know, necessary props, grips, sound people, directors, and what have you. And then we had all the combat camera teams out there. And then we had them in with, the, with the air groups. So these guys were all anxious to get home and get back to their jobs, which were promised to them. And uh, so... Uh, I was sitting uh, fat, dumb, and happy out in, in uh, Nagasaki when I get an order say, from headquarters saying, come home immediately by the fastest available and uh, no interruptions uh, authorized, uh, all this kind of stuff. And the adjutant said, what did you do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, the reason I was brought back was because I was one of the few regular officers. The rest were reserves that were all getting out. and. We only had about five officers left in the Marine Corps, and 
And so anyway, we worked on that and finally got it built up. And uh, then, what I really uh, want, if you can, and, yeah. and what I'm really looking for is just more, kind of more philosophical lines, something like, you know, yeah. I just feel, you know, my 40 or 60 yeah. whatever years of my career, you know, did this, this, and this. Not too much detail again. We're talking very yeah. short. Right, right, right. Can, right. Kind of keep it in a philosophical, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I really, you know, contributed, um, you know, I did my part in wars, and, you know, hopefully I made a difference. Something like that. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but yeah. that's kind of more what I'm looking at. It's just kind of a wrap-up, just, you know, about your service to your country and, you know, that you're proud of it or and proud of your accomplishments. Yeah. Let me see how I can get that. Well, uh, well, let me ask you, are you, you proud of your service? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm proud of the service. Uh, I'm trying to figure a way to work that in. The... Uh, period of time right after the war, uh, uh, we were so involved with trying to keep the photographic services together that, that uh, there wasn't much thought about the war, but, but uh, I was very proud of what we had accomplished. The, uh, the films that had been made and that sort of thing had been of extreme help to the Corps. And uh, <clears throat> then I worked at the Department of Defense for 23 years and, and uh, was chief of audiovisual there and reporting to the Secretary of Defense and, and uh, worked with all agencies of the government. And uh, I felt like because of the film that I'd shot and the things that I'd done in World War II, that I was on a, on a roll that never stopped. And uh, it, I had some of the best jobs I thought in the city. And uh, uh, it was just a joy to be able to do them. And it all stemmed from my taking pictures for Tarawa. I'll give, yeah. give you your climax. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you all right? Hmm? Got it all? You got uh, the drive working? It's still working. Or it never stopped working. I can't change it. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got to okay. take my daughter to a medical appointment.